Welcome to episode 16 of Ask the Grounding Experts, where our experts from ENS Grounding Solutions answer your engineering questions about the world of grounding and earthing. In this episode, ENS President David Stocken addresses part two of a two-part series answering the question, what happens when lightning strikes a tower? It's all yours, David. All right, so this is part two of our engineering factors where we talk about what happens when lightning strikes a, a lattice tower, a metal lattice tower. If you haven't watched part one, please do so. It's kind of important to follow along the story here. But where we were last off is the lightning hit our tower 100,000 amps. It's been bouncing around inside of our lattice tower. We have these magnetic fields that are forming and they're collapsing. Uh, an event that took exactly fractions of a second to uh, enter into, you know, put that 100,000 amps into is taking at least 10 seconds, if not longer, to get out of our tower just because of the time it takes leakage current. And that leakage current sends out uh, electricity across the surface of the earth in a form of a wave, sort of very similar, you can think in your mind, as dropping a pebble into water, sends this wave out. And these, this wave has differences in voltages. The further away you are from the tower, the less and less voltage you'll see. If your feet happen to be walking towards the tower, and your front foot is at one voltage, your back foot's at another voltage, this could cause enough to cause what we call step voltages and it can actually kill you um, or hurt you significantly. Same thing if your hand happens to be touching the tower, the difference in, in voltage between your hand and your feet can be enough to cause your heart to fibrillate and that's bad. Uh, so now to carry on with these different factors, one of the things that happens is our Four tower footings that are in the ground form a, a, an electrode system. And that electrode system has a resistance to ground. In a previous video we have, uh, or a podcast depending on how you're watching us today, it's called the Curse of the Resistance to Ground Spec. I highly recommend you, you uh, uh, listen to that one. The resistance to ground overall deals with Ohm's Law. You have 100,000 amps coming in. If your resistance to ground is 1 ohm, we're going to get 100,000 volts on that tower. If it's 10 ohms, we're going to get 10 times that. We're going to get, you know, a million volts on that tower is going to form. That's what the importance of the resistance to ground. Um, it's a very important spec. It's not the only spec. We also have differences in potential. So one tower leg may have a little bit more effective connection to the earth than the next leg. If we measured each one, if we said our overall resistance of that tower was 10 ohms, well, we might find that each tower leg is roughly somewhere around 20 ohms individually, but one of them might be slightly better. Maybe it's 15 ohms and the other ones are 25 and together they add up to 10. The one that's 15 ohms is going to get a far more significant amount of current on it than the other ones. And this causes a difference in potential across our tower. We call that the ground potential difference. This is one of the most single most important factors in all of grounding is the ground potential difference. If you recall in some previous episodes we talked about a 747 flying through the air. And if we reduce the resistance or difference in potential across that 747 to as low as we can, we don't generate voltages that can cause damage to our airplane. The same thing occurs in this tower. If we can eliminate the difference in potential across, we can cause an even flow. And we cause a common constant voltage across the entire tower. We end up with a less likelihood of causing damage. Imagine you had a cellular equipment mounted to this tower, and one leg happened to be significantly in better contact with the earth than the other three. You can cause a massive flow of electricity curve right across your equipment, causing damage. And the same thing happens here: ground potential difference. And it's a very important factor. In fact, it may, in fact, be the single most important factor in all of electrical grounding is the ground potential difference. We also end up with this resistance to ground, the overall resistance in reference to remote earth. 
Uh, we've talked about this in some of our cal and our, our uh, comments. We've got some previous podcasts and YouTube videos about how we do testing and what the importance of remote earth is. So uh, if you've listened to our thing on three-point follow potential testing, that's what we're talking about here. If we measure the resistance of that in reference to remote earth, we would get some ohmic resistance and that helps with our Ohm's law and how much voltage is going to apply. Um, some of the other factors that occur here in this is um, nearby objects that may be nearby. So the electromagnetic fields can form that form on this tower can form into fences, they can form into buried gas pipelines that may be nearby. We get coating stress voltages. These are the voltages that will form the difference between the voltages traveling through the earth versus the steel of the gas pipeline and the coating between the earth and the steel and whether or not that's enough to cause uh, corrosion to occur on that coating and stress it enough to cause it to crack and to uh, allow corrosion to start occurring. Uh, there's uh, In our classes we cover lots and lots of these details. We go through them in great detail uh, uh, on a number of different factors that are uh, occurring in these uh, footings including our sphere of influence issues that occur. Um, for each one of these electrodes there's an individual sphere of influence that gets involved. Um, I believe we talked about that in our uh, testing uh, videos and some of our previous podcasts you may want to look at those as well. Now how we solve some of these problems involves copper and you can imagine if we place a copper ring around our tower instead of four individual electrodes we can effectively balance those into a common single electrode so we can reduce our difference in potential. If we run a copper wire up our tower so we can eliminate the difference in potential from the top to the bottom of the tower in, fact, in essence a lightning protection system we can help to reduce the magnetic fields that have to form because if you recall copper is diamagnetic. If we add a bunch of electrodes to our base of our tower we can increase the leakage current rate of our tower. So lightning hits the tower it comes down a copper path versus a steel path primarily. It's going to take both paths but it will primarily take the copper path. Hits a ground loop hits some dedicated grounding electrodes that are designed to handle leakage current and instead of only handling 10,000 amps per second we might be able to handle four or five times that. So instead of taking 10 seconds to eliminate that uh, electrical energy we can do it in a couple of seconds instead. So we reduce that time it takes uh, to clear those faults if you would that a lightning strike we can clear it. We also reduce uh, the magnetic uh, fields that form because we placed a diamagnetic material in with the steel so the time it takes for those magnetic fields to collapse is dramatically reduced um, when they start to form and then recollapse back down. Uh, we can uh, collect that material, much those that energy and dump it out down into the surrounding soil. If we have people that are happen to be touching our tower that ground loop that's around it can help balance so that the difference in potential between the hand and feet are less and we can reduce the touch voltages. If we place it in a, again a, with doing a little analysis we actually help to reduce the step voltages by making sure that that current goes down ground rods deep into the earth and away from where personnel may be standing. And we can reduce both our touch and step voltages again by properly designing these ground loops and grounding electrodes in combination with the copper we can help to reduce the effects of that lightning strike on personnel, on the equipment that may be mounted to this and uh, uh, you know save some lives in the process. Uh, one of the other things that's important to note is uh, concrete is, uh, contains water. And when water heats up, one cup of water will roughly turn into something like 1,700 cups of steam. Uh, if lightning comes down, hits your tower footing, 
causes steam to form because of the heat and can crack that concrete, not only allowing corrosion to get in there, but reducing the structural stability of that tower, which could cause it to collapse. A good grounding system helps to maintain the structural integrity of your foundations and supports. It can also reduce corrosion as well, uh, but that's another uh, topic for uh, down the road where we'll maybe have a discussion about grounding and corrosion and how that works. Uh, so to wrap this up, uh, there are a number of different engineering factors that occur in any structure, whether we use a lattice tower today as your example, but it could be a building of any shape. They're going to have, they're going to act, that building or structure is going to act like an antenna to that lightning strike and it's going to resonate around and you're going to get a number, a great number of engineering factors that are going to occur uh, inside of that. And it's very important to understand how those uh, grounding systems can help to eliminate hazards resulting in that. And it doesn't have to be a lightning strike. It can be an electrical fault from your transformer. Uh, they carry massive, massive amounts of current. Even your home can have very significant uh, uh, fault currents that can travel through it. Uh, when you start dealing with industrial sized transformers you can have some very significant uh, hazardous currents that travel through, particularly when uh, your grounding system is going to be used as part of the fault current path. Uh, but that's a, a topic for another discussion down the road. So I hope you found this useful. Um, please, uh, uh, if you like uh, this topic of engineering factors and the, the different phenomena that can occur, we have full classes for this. Uh, they're hours and hours long with graphics and we walk you through it. It's uh, a lot of fun. People really tend to enjoy it. Check out our website. Uh, we'll have classes coming up periodically uh, for that. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, uh, make sure you uh, hit like and there's a subscribe in there too for subscribing to the channel. If you're listening to this on a podcast, please hit subscribe. Uh, leave us a comment, write us an email, give us a call. Uh, we'd love to hear back from you. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thanks so much for watching. If you found this episode helpful, please give us a quick like down below and subscribe to stay up to date on future educational videos we will be publishing. And feel free to post questions or comments below as well. We might even feature your questions in future videos. If you'd like to learn more about the amazing world of electrical engineering and grounding, be sure to check out our certified online courses at the links in the description below to kickstart your career. See you next time.